Final Fantasy has featured thousands of enemies throughout the years, and there have been many, many sources of inspiration. But as each new game can only feature a finite number of enemies, as the franchise has only continued to grow in size, developers have faced the continuing dilemma of where they should pay homage to the past and where they should be creative and introduce something new. As a byproduct, enemies that used to appear with significant frequency in the earlier days of the franchise have started to become forgotten. And throughout this video, we're going to run through some enemies that despite having a certain degree of notoriety, have been used sparingly in the last 15 to 20 years of the franchise and have often been relegated to appearing in spin-offs and mobile titles. Ever since the first game released in December of 1987, dragons have been a near permanent addition to the roster of Final Fantasy enemies. This was no doubt owing to their prominent position within Dungeons and & Dragons, and it saw the original game feature not only named dragons such as Bahamut and Tiamat, but also various colours of dragon, each with their own elemental affinities. As the franchise has built out, many more dragons have featured, as well as more unique variants, such as the Silver Dragon and Midgar Soma, but one of the most feared has always been the Red Dragon. This was the first type of dragon encountered in Final Fantasy 1, and it could be found deep within Mount Gullug. Here it could appear as a very rare random encounter, with there only being a 1.6% chance of the fight occurring, and if encountered, the red dragon would always be fought as a singular enemy. Due to their rarity, red dragons represented a significant hike up in terms of challenge compared to many of the other fights faced at that point in the game, and because of their strength and devastating blaze attack, only the bold would be keen to tackle that challenge head on. If you wanted to force the issue and assert yourself, you could guarantee a red dragon fight as one would be found guarding the flame mail. In Final Fantasy II, the red dragon was used in similar fashion. It appeared in the Jade Passage where it guarded the Yuichi bow, and it could be encountered as an unpleasant random battle in Pandemonium. This was then much the same in Final Fantasy 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Red dragons either appeared as a tough boss that was guarding something important, or as a very challenging random encounter that was a step up from the other monsters that could be faced in that particular area, and when they did appear, they would always appear as a singular enemy. Final Fantasy VIII deviated a little as the Red Dragon was replaced by a variant called the Ruby Dragon, and as a homage to the original game, Final Fantasy IX also featured Red Dragons in Mount Gullug, but they did not appear as a lone enemy. Due to their prominence, it should have cemented Red Dragons as a permanent addition to the best area of every single game, but after the release of Final Fantasy IX, Red Dragons have been almost non-existent. Even though dragons featured in Final Fantasy X, they were given specific names as opposed to colour designations, and despite Final Fantasy X II reverting on that decision, another variant called the Claret Dragon was preferred to the Red Dragon. It was much the same in Final Fantasy XI and XII, as even though there were almost 200 variants of dragons, hydras, worms and wyverns featured between the two games, none of them were named in association to the colour red. Final Fantasy XIII skipped dragons completely, with them only featuring sporadically in its two sequels, and it was only in Final Fantasy XIV that again has a massive focus on dragons that the Red Dragon returned. But unlike the Glory Days, they were just a common form of dragon, as opposed to being anything of note. Final Fantasy XV then chose to skip dragons too, and it means that despite having so much prominence in the first 10 years of the franchise, Red Dragons have been relegated to obscurity in the past two decades, having seldom featured outside of tribute appearances such as World of Final Fantasy and some mobile games. Worms don't sound like the most glamorous of enemies, but of course, within the realm of fantasy, they're a bit more scary than the common earthworm. The original Final Fantasy introduced a far more menacing version of the earthworm, they were massive in size and had enormous mouths filled with razor sharp teeth, but even though they were quite grand in scale and looked rather grotesque, worms were quite common, and when isolated, they were straightforward to deal with. Final Fantasy II featured a similar implementation, but a new variant of worm was created called the Round Worm. Unlike the other worms, which were again quite common as random encounters, the Round Worm appeared as a boss within Leviathan before being demoted to appearing as a tough random encounter inside Pandemonium alongside the Red Dragon. 
After this, worms became a bit more diverse. Within Final Fantasy III, thanks to the addition of the Blood Worm, they were made into a tough encounter when attempting to traverse through Nepto Temple when minified, and in Final Fantasy IV, the Abyss Worm was a tough foe that could be faced on the Red Moon. Final Fantasy V saw a sandworm appear as a boss in the Desert of Shifting Sands, and in Final Fantasy VI, they were given a more prominent role. Slagworms and landworms were tough random encounters in the world of Ruin, and the Zone Eater was connected with the quest to acquire Gogo. But after that, the role of worms started to regress back to the earlier days. They did feature in Final Fantasy VII, IX, and X, and a variant design was used for Final Fantasy VIII and XI, but despite many retaining the intimidating appearance, worms became quite easy to beat. Since the release of Final Fantasy XI, outside of Final Fantasy Type-0 and Final Fantasy Dimensions, worms have been almost non-existent, and not even Final Fantasy XIV has seen fit to bring them back, outside of using them as bait for fishing that is. The concept of weapon was introduced in Final Fantasy VI. Appearing as a weapon of mass destruction that was created during the War of the Magi, Ultima Weapon was a formidable enemy, and guarding the Warring Triad, it was the strongest boss the party would face in the World of Balance. This concept was then expanded upon in significant fashion with Final Fantasy VII, as instead of there being just one weapon, thanks to the original Japanese version and its international counterpart, four weapons could be fought, and another, Sapphire Weapon, appeared as part of the story. Unlike Ultima Weapon, which resembled a behemoth, weapons in Final Fantasy VII, which were created by the planet to defend it against great threats, had more in common with the kaiju that have been introduced through Japanese films. They would roam the planet seeking out threats to destroy, with two, Ultimate and Diamond, being boss fights integrated into the story, and the others, Ruby and Emerald, being added as super bosses for the North American release. Final Fantasy VIII marked the first appearance of Omega Weapon, and Jade Weapon appeared some years later in the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, but unlike the other variants of Weapon, they have seldom been referenced outside of retcon appearances. Whereas Ultima, Ruby, Diamond, Emerald, and even Sapphire Weapon have been introduced in more recent entries into the franchise, such as Final Fantasy XIV and XV, Omega Weapon, which is often considered to be the ultimate weapon, has not been seen within the mainline series since Final Fantasy X and its sequel. It did appear as the final boss in Dirge of Cerberus though, and in more recent times also appeared in Mobius, and these appearances give hope that Omega Weapon may feature at some point in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but it's been odd that despite its gravitas in comparison to the other weapons, Omega has often been overlooked. Another enemy that has suffered the same fate is the Marilith. Introduced as part of the famous Four Fiends Quartet alongside Lich, Kraken, and Tiamat, within the story of Final Fantasy I, Marilith awoke 200 years early following the defeat of Lich and took up residence in Mount Gulag. This presented Marilith with the Four Fiend associated with the fire element, and this was clear in the two encounters against her, as she would use Fire 2 in the boss encounter in Mount Gulag, before using Fire 3 when reappearing as a boss inside the Chaos Shrine. Appearing as part of the Four Fiends, Merilith paid tribute to the Shiteno concept found within Japanese culture that harkened back to the Sengoku period, where Daimyo, in this case Chaos, would appoint four generals to special positions of honour. That concept would again be used in Final Fantasy IV, but Marilith was not part of this reappearance, and instead appeared as a weak enemy that was known as a screamer within the original SNES release. Referencing the past, Final Fantasy IX brought back the concept of the Four Fiends, and the Marilith was present alongside Lich, Kraken, and Tiamat. But unlike Lich, Marilith, who appeared as the Fire Guardian and was known as Malaris in the English localization, was not fought inside the Fire Shrine. The party would instead need to wait until Memoria and the Crystal World, where Malaris appeared alongside the other four fiends. It was a nice ode, but it highlighted a common trend with Marilith, inclusion was often overlooked in favour of the other four fiends. Tiamat, Lich, and Kraken have each appeared in numerous main numbered installments outside of their default four fiends designation, and they have often been used frequently within spin-off titles. Within Final Fantasy Tactics, for example, Lich was a summon spell, Kraken has also featured within Final Fantasy XI and XIV as both the guardian of the famed Kraken Club and as a boss, and Tiamat, well, its involvement puts the other four fiends to shame. 
but while developers have found places for those other three with some degree of regularity, Merilith has seen sporadic appearances at best. There was an appearance as the antagonist in Brotherhood Final Fantasy XV, but the only other time Merilith has appeared without being accompanied by other members of the Four Fiends was in Final Fantasy XII, where it was a pretty generic mark. The Basilisk has been a near permanent feature within the roster of enemies since it was introduced in the original Final Fantasy, but somewhere along the line, it was decided by the developers that what a Basilisk was would need to be redefined. In its original appearance, the Basilisk was a giant green lizard, and it shared the same model with the Lizard and Fire Lizard. They could be found in numerous locations, and were not that difficult to defeat, but they could be annoying due to their ability to petrify a nod to its mythological roots. This was kept consistent within Final Fantasy II, but even though a similar design was carried over to Final Fantasy III, it no longer petrified. Instead, its stare attack could now put party members to sleep. Final Fantasy IV then changed the colour of the Basilisk and removed its ability to petrify, but Final Fantasy VI, VII and IX adopted a design and moveset that was very faithful to the original appearance. By this point, it was pretty well established that the Basilisk was a giant lizard who was more often than not green, but the developers who were responsible for creating the monsters on Final Fantasy X decided that they were going to forget that and come up with their own interpretation. It saw the Basilisk reimagined to look more like a serpent, and although this did deviate from the established norm, it actually tied in closer to the traditional mythological look, which saw Basilisk defined as a legendary reptile that was reputed to be a serpent king. Final Fantasy XII then took this interpretation a bit further, as the Basilisk shed its appendages and became a much more literal interpretation of a snake. It also removed the ability for the Basilisk to petrify, but its attacks could poison instead, furthering its association with snakes. Final Fantasy XIV then brought the Basilisk back to its roots, but Final Fantasy XV went quite extreme by having it appear as a variant of Cockatrice. This was quite random on face value, but the Final Fantasy XV development team had done their homework, or so it seems, as in Final Fantasy III, the Cockatrice was changed from being a bird to a variant of Lizard that had the same design as the Basilisk. But it doesn't explain why the Basilisk was changed to look like a hulking lizard in Justice Monsters 5. One of the most adorable enemies you can square off against in Final Fantasy has to be the Mew. These little critters were introduced in Final Fantasy VI as weak enemies that could be found near South Figaro, and even though other variants exist, they were also quite weak in comparison to other monsters who could be found in the same locations. Outside of teaching Gal the snare ability, Mew were quite memorable thanks to their design, as they appeared to be climbing out of a hole, and in Final Fantasy VII this aspect of the enemy was amplified as the hole was made more into a hill and they were made to look more like squirrels, and who doesn't love squirrels? They could be encountered near the Chocobo farm and could again teach the party something, the level 4 suicide enemy skill. And to build upon the notion of Mew being pathetically weak, they could even heal the party and give them money! No Mew could be found in Final Fantasy VIII, but they did reappear in Final Fantasy IX. This time, Mew were still very weak, and they were even part of the friendly monster side quest, but the design was changed to remove the hole. Mew then skipped Final Fantasy X and XI, and reappeared in Final Fantasy XII as part of the Dream Hair family of enemies. This meant the Mew were no longer rodents, at least by the definition provided by our own modern science, and as such, their design was changed in a significant manner. After this, Mew have pretty much disappeared from the Final Fantasy bestiary, and this is such a shame, as it felt like they should have been quite memorable within those earlier appearances. The only branch of Final Fantasy to agree was Crystal Chronicles, as Mew have appeared in every single iteration outside of the Crystal Bearers. Oh, and they did also appear in World of Final Fantasy, as a ridiculously adorable ball of puff. That then brings us on to the final enemy that has unfortunately faded into obscurity, despite being quite famous in the earlier days of the franchise. The Antlion debuted in Final Fantasy II, and it could be found in the large desert near Palamecia. Thanks to its giant pincers, it could deal powerful physical attacks and could even paralyse its foes, but it was a pretty forgettable appearance. The Antlion wouldn't come into the spotlight until Final Fantasy IV when it was integrated into the main story. 
After being struck down with desert fever, the party needed to obtain a sand pearl from the antlion's den in order to cure Rosa of her ailment. It just so happened that the Damsian royal family had a connection with the antlions, who were normally docile, but the antlions had become enraged by the disruption of the crystals and attacked Edward, leading to what could be a troublesome boss fight. What we saw replaced almost everything that had been seen within Final Fantasy II. The antlion did still have huge pincers, but they now dwelled in a sandy pit and other features became much more pronounced. Final Fantasy V pushed this notion further. After being fought as a mandatory boss inside the antlion pit, its visual design was amended to actually show the pit as opposed to it being atop the sand. And the significance of this particular monster was emphasised as an antlion appeared in the Final Fantasy V sequel movie called Legend of the Crystals as a minor antagonist right at the start. Perhaps because antlions had been so connected with the story within Final Fantasy IV and V, they skipped every game after, until Final Fantasy IX. For their grand reappearance, they could be fought numerous times in connection to the story. During Disc 1, an antlion had to be fought in order to rescue Prince Park, and later on, they could be fought as the party searched to find Kuja's Desert Palace should they investigate the wrong sand pit. This, of course, made sense as it pulled from prominent parts of the franchise, and in this regard, its design did not disappoint. The antlion looked aggressive, with huge red pincers, and the pit itself was integrated into the design as it was in Final Fantasy V. And as a rather cool nod, this exact design was replicated when the antlion appeared as a boss in the original Crystal Chronicles. Final Fantasy XI saw the most comprehensive appearance of antlions, as they were an entire family of creatures. It meant that there wasn't just one type of antlion, there were over 10, and some of them, such as the Alasta antlion, were notorious monsters that guarded valuable equipment. They would again be found in sandy regions, but due to the open world nature of Final Fantasy XI, the design reverted back to something more similar to Final Fantasy II and IV, where they were free moving. The most recent iteration of the antlion we've seen within the main series has been in Final Fantasy XII, where they appeared as an elite mark in the Lusu Mines, but unlike all previous versions, this time the antlion was based on a praying mantis, and it was blue. Outside of a few appearances in the mobile games, the antlion has not been seen since, which is quite a shame given its prominence within the earlier games of the franchise. That may well be due to its complicated design which requires it to be sunk in a sand pit, but who knows, there's always hope that we can see a strong reappearance just like we did in Final Fantasy IX. But yeah, I think with that, we're done. There were seven enemies that featured in prominent ways in the earlier days of the franchise, but have since been used sparringly. Let us know in the comments what you'd like to see reappear in the near future, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Raining Ekum, Logan Ninja, and Benjamin Snow, who are super special Ungeon Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.